Hi, what I have here on the workbench today is a PTS200 soldering iron that is rated for a maximum power of 100 watts. Banggood sent me this soldering iron for me to do a review on. If you are interested in getting one after watching this video, you have followed the link provided in the video description below. Before even diving into the review, I can tell you that I'm already very impressed by the ruggedness of this soldering iron, and that is because, as you can see here, the box the soldering iron came in was uh, badly damaged during shipping. Now, I'm actually quite puzzled as to what could have possibly happened during the shipment, as to get a big hole like this through this box requires quite a bit of force, and it's not something that could happen easily. Now, my guess is that perhaps either some heavy metal objects dropped on this poor packaging, or the box was somehow pressed really hard against a sharp corner of some sort during shipment, because otherwise it would not get a big gouge like this. When I open the box, let me just uh, open it really quick here. You can see that the entire section where the main piece of the soldering iron is placed is totally deformed. In fact, if you look carefully, you will see the markings on the top of the box here. And that's due to the force exerted from the bottom during the incident. When I first saw this, I thought for sure the content would have been damaged without any doubt. But when I took out the soldering iron, and uh, it looked okay. When I later plugged it in, it seemed everything was working properly. The only thing I can probably see is this dent. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's quite noticeable. Anyway, this actually shows you how much abuse the CNC metal housing of the soldering iron can take. So this is definitely an impressive start of this review. The PTS200 comes with a few CNC parts. I have already assembled it, but let me disassemble it right now and show you. I just uh, zoomed in a little bit so you can see a little better here. This is the body of that uh, soldering iron and it's one piece. If I focus, you can see the circuit board is inside. Now, let me see if you can see that dent a little bit more clearly here. Yeah, you can see it's right here. Now, of course, this is a black background and it doesn't really show up easily on camera, but uh, you can feel this is at least a few millimeters of dent. So. If we did not have this metal housing, and you can see it's quite thick, it would definitely have crushed the circuit board inside due to that external force during shipment. By the way, I'm not sure what that grounding symbol here means, as there's no screw for me to screw in a grounding wire, but I do believe that the metal casing is actually connected to the soldering iron tip, at least that's what I think. So let me actually put it back in and uh, just uh, buzz it out really quickly here. To put the soldering iron in, you first are going to screw in this uh, spacer here. Let me just uh, get it in. I think it's actually this way around. And now you can push the tip assembly all the way in. So it sits securely here. So now let me try to buzz it out and see if it is connected here. And let me see. Yeah, we do get continuity between the tip and uh, the analyzed aluminum body here. So the tip is definitely connected to the case. But uh, I'm not sure how you would ground the soldering iron if you really want to. I suppose you could screw in a ground wire between the tip and uh, this uh, cap, but that's not very convenient here. There are two pieces of these metal sleeves here. One is significantly longer than the one that we currently put on the soldering iron. According to the online manual, the shorter sleeve is meant for the TS series of the iron tips, which is what we have here. And the longer sleeve is designed for the T12 series iron tips. The soldering tips are standard and interchangeable with many soldering irons, such as the TS100 and TS101. You have a wide variety of tips to choose from, depending on the job at hand. You can use chisel tip, bevel tip, and conical tip, and so on and so forth. Personally, I prefer either chiseled or beveled tips, as they have larger surface area for better heat transfer. The tip I have here is beveled. 
Now putting this PTS-200 along with the Miniware TS-100 soldering iron, you will get a sense of the dimensions here. While these soldering irons accept the same tips, the PTS-200 is quite a bit larger than the TS-100. And the PTS-200 also feels heavier and more substantial in your hand compared to the TS-100 because of the machined aluminum housing. Again, if similar shipping mishap happened to the TS-100, I don't think it would have survived due to the plastic housing here. Before powering on, I wanted to point out that the only way to power this PTS-200 is via an USB-C cable here. As you can see, that's the only connector here. Now, in my opinion, I would have preferred having the option of using a standard barrel connector. The reason is that the soldering iron can consume up to 100 watts, and a proper USB 3 PD power supply that is capable of delivering this amount of power is usually quite expensive and could easily cost more than the soldering iron itself. Now, I do believe this PTS-200 can auto-negotiate the operating voltage from a proper USB 3 PD compatible power source, but as you will see shortly, it doesn't really follow the USB 3 PD spec, as you can simply power it with a standard power supply with any voltage output between 12 volts and 21 volts. And that's what we'll be using to test the soldering iron, as the only USB 3 power supply I currently have at the moment is for my laptop, which can only deliver up to 65 watts. To use a regular power supply, all you have to do is just build a simple power cable using a USB 3 connector like what I have done here. As you can see, I actually doubled up the wiring here because we're not using the signal wire here. So therefore, I'm just uh, doubling this up, pairing it with a power wire so that I can maximize the current carrying capability of these wires. Now I have set the power supply to the max spec voltage of uh, 21 volts. And uh, let me plug it in and see how long does it take to get to the working temperature here. It does take a few seconds to boot up and you can see the voltage showing up here is 21.3 volts. So it's a little bit off as it currently I set the voltage to be 21 volts. So let me press this button and uh, it will start heating up. And let's take a look at how long it takes. So it looks like it took about 12 seconds and you do see there is an overshot here and I assume that's actually the programming to ensure it reaches the maximum operating temperature in the shortest amount of time as when it settles you can see that is settled at 290 which is the current set temperature. Of course you can always use these buttons to increase and decrease the operating temperature here. Let's see if I do 300 and it will get on to 300 really fast here and uh, let's go back to 280. Unfortunately I don't have anything to measure the tip temperature accurately and for most of the soldering job you don't really need the temperature to be that accurate as long as it is stable you can always just adjust the temperature based on the need. Of course that takes experience. Soldering is more of an art than science unless you are talking about SMD reflowing and in that case, the temperature profile is actually going to be very critical. Before I forget, let's take a look at the current waveform while the soldering iron is in operation. For that, I'm going to use the CP503 current probe that I reviewed a few episodes ago. Everything is set up and you can see the scope right now we're setting at a horizontal of 100 milliseconds per division. So let me power on the soldering iron here. You can immediately see the pulse on the screen here. And we had a peak to peak current of about 4 amps that corresponds to roughly 80 watts. And of course, right now the soldering iron just overshot the preset temperature and is coming down. So I assume at uh, some point, yep, you can see that it is uh, heating up again. And uh, this is just a periodical signal here. As you can see, the controller essentially switches the power on and off based on some predefined algorithm. The switching frequency is actually quite low. I was actually expecting it to be somewhat higher. As you can see here, once it's heated up, the pulse essentially is about uh, 150 milliseconds in width to maintain the temperature of the iron here. Now let's take a look at the settings. 
To get to the setting menu, you just need to long press the middle button. A short press on the button will turn on the iron. By the look of it, you can actually change the tip settings. So let's take a look here. And by the way, you press the middle button and it goes into the menu. And uh, you can use the left and right to change the sub-menu item selection here. And you can see we can change the tip, but out of the box, you can see that the tip is actually defaulted to T12. And there's no way for me to change it. Now, this is kind of odd as the tip supplied is TS, not T12. But there's probably not too much difference in terms of the heating profile. And I'm sure it's something can be adjusted in the firmware in the future when it catches up. But anyway, so now we cannot change it. Let's go back. By the look of it, you can also do manual calibration if you have the equipment so that the temperature readings will be more accurate. Now, as I mentioned before, for most of the soldering work you do, it doesn't really require this level of uh, precision. And you can easily adjust the temperature based on the soldering results. And of course, you can rename the tip, delete the tip, and create a new tip, and return to the main menu. And uh, the return is actually not very consistent. Sometimes it returns to this screen, but it really should return to the prior screen where it came from, which is the top of the sub-menu. Now on to temperature settings. Just like the TS100 or the Pineso soldering irons, the PTS200 also has a built-in accelerometer, which can detect whether the soldering iron is in use. And you can set the standby temperature to, in here it says as a sleep temperature, you can set it to a lower temperature. So on the one hand, you can get to the operating temperature quickly when you pick up the iron. And then on the other hand, you can prolong the lifespan of the iron tip as it's not constantly operating at a high temperature. You can also set a boost temperature. The idea is to help you maintain the soldering temperature when dealing with a larger thermal mass, such as the ground plane. And by raising the temperature momentarily, it helps to compensate the temperature drop when the iron comes into contact with those uh, large thermal mass areas. Obviously, ideally, what you want to do is not to raise the temperature, but to have a soldering iron tip that is large enough so that it has enough thermal mass. Also, you could always just adjust the temperature manually. But the nice thing about this boost feature is that the temperature boost is only temporary and can be adjusted as we will see next. Let me return. So that brings us to the timer setting where you can set the idle timer after which the iron would go to sleep mode as mentioned earlier, and if you leave it idle long enough, it will actually shut down based on the shutdown timer setting. So here we set up as five minutes. The boost time determines how long the temperature stays in the elevated state before dropping back to the normal operating temperature. And finally, the wake threshold adjusts the accelerometer's sensitivity, so it knows when the iron gets picked up. And by the way, the screen doesn't automatically rotate when you flip the iron over. And this could potentially be a problem if you are left-handed. But I'm sure this feature could easily be included in future firmware updates, as the soldering iron already has an accelerometer built in. And that's pretty much the manual settings here. Let's take a look at the information. And you can see the temperature here, we're reading about 43 degrees Celsius. I assume that's actually measuring the internal temperature as this does heat up a little bit when powered on. And here we have the version number is 3.14. And besides that, there's really not much to it. You can restore the factory default. You can change the languages. And uh, that is all there is. Now let's use this iron to do some soldering work. So you can see no problem at all. Next, let's take a look at the circuit board with a large ground plane here. This is a switching power supply. And uh, let's uh, flip it over and take a look here. So I'm currently set the temperature to 320 degrees, as you can see here. 
and uh, let's see if we are able to melt the solder here and yeah we are able to you can see that it's uh, relatively easy here and that's actually pretty good now this one is a little tough because we have a transformer lead here so let's use the boost feature here so I'm pressing the button again now this goes to 370 see if it makes any difference yep clearly you can see that it's it started melting here now this is actually kind of extreme in general you don't encounter solder joints this big this just tells you that this iron is more than capable of doing repair work on a circuit board like this well so far this definitely looks like a decent soldering iron and we already have proof that it can take a lot of abuse I'll be using it as my primary soldering iron in the upcoming month and will definitely let you know if I find any long-term reliability issues. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up the next time.